Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 2022 FCC Beverage Report event. I am Darlene McBain, and I work on the industry stakeholder relationships team here at FCC, and I'm happy to be your host for today's event. Thank you for joining us. And as beverage manufacturers and as the people that work closely with the beverage sector, you are an important part of Canada's food and beverage industry. So we thank you for finding the time uh, out of your busy days to join us here today. I'm coming to you today from my home office in Montreal, Quebec. And I do want to acknowledge that Montreal is a traditional and unceded territory of the Mohawk and Algonquin people. And it is a place that has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst the nations. Wherever we find ourselves today in Canada, we are on traditional Indigenous territories with rich traditions, stories and histories that should be understood and honoured. And it is our commitment in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration to honour these people as vital contributors to our society and respect the diversity and the strength for all of the Indigenous people across the country. So now before I introduce our keynote speaker, J.P. Gervais, there is a little housekeeping that I need to cover. This session will be recorded and a link will be sent out to everyone who is registered here today. So if you need to step away from the presentation or if you'd like to re-listen or share this content with your business partners or colleagues, the presentation will be available in a few days. If you run into any technical issues, please feel free to press on the help support button for assistance. And as you have noticed, there is a chat on the right hand side of the screen. So please drop a hello in there and let us know where you're logging in from today. And now let me introduce to you our speaker. We are thrilled to have with us JP Gervais with us today. JP is the Vice President and Chief Economist at FCC. His insights help guide strategy and monitor risks throughout FCC. And today, JP will be sharing with us the results of the beverage report that was just released this week. The FCC beverage report provides an annual review of the opportunities and risks for you, the Canadian beverage manufacturing sector, to help you navigate the economic realities of today and the future. So hello, JP, and welcome. Well, welcome, Darlene. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, hello to all of you. Good morning if you're on the West Coast. Good afternoon. Otherwise, um, my name is JP Gervais. I'm looking forward to the next 20 or 25 minutes to present to you an overview of our FCC beverage report for 2022. Now, if you are interested as well in food, we did release our food report 2022 towards the end of March. But this is uh, today, this is going to be strictly focusing on the beverage industry. And um, I, I want to say as well that this is a very diverse sector. Um, I'm going to uh, talk to you about the economic importance of the sector, and I'm going to do it at a very high level. And we'll, as well, afterwards, take the time to uh, dive into some of the subsectors. So I'll be uh, talking about wineries, distilleries, breweries, as well as the non-alcoholic beverage manufacturers. But uh, I will spend the first five to 10 minutes talk about a general overview of the sector, as well as some of the factors that I believe are common trends and common drivers of the operating environment for beverage manufacturers. Now, there are tons of details in the report. My objective here or my intent is not to go through all of the details. And my understanding is that those that registered for this event are going to get a link uh, that will um, make them, you know, the, um, be able to then download the report from the website, but you can go to fcc.ca and download a copy of the report uh, quite easily. So if we are able to magnify the table up on the screen right now, um, what I did is I circled one number, which is 11.3%. That's the growth in overall beverage manufacturing sales for 2021. We're going to be talking about the outlook for the rest of the year, for sure, in 2022. But I think it's worth our time to talk a little bit about the last couple of years because we're still transitioning towards, and I'm not so sure that I like the words new normal, but there is definitely a sense of normalizing towards something else, right? Not so sure if that future state is going to be exactly like the one prior to the pandemic, but there is no doubt that as we're going through 2020, 2021, and now 
we're still very much influenced by some of the purchasing patterns that emerged because of the pandemic. 11.3% growth in sales. That's pretty significant, right? It's a 14, the beverage industry in Canada, it's a $14.5 billion industry in terms of sales. And when we measure sales in dollars, there are two drivers behind this, right? One is prices. Uh, and for sure, this is a topic at the forefront of, of everybody's uh, thinking when it comes to, to, to thinking about the operating environment for beverage manufacturers with all of the inflation right now in the industry. And the second thing behind the growth in, in, in sales when measured in dollars is the volume. So if you break down the 11.3%, you know, between volume and price, we still have, we, we have, I would say about uh, 6% growth in volume. So it's been a a really good year in 2021. You'll see that in some of the forecasts that we have in 2020 for 2022. Uh, I would I would not say that this is as positive as it was in 2021. In fact, you're going to see a little bit of a decline in 2022. But I would point out that when you look at 2020 the 2022 forecasts relative to prior to the pandemic, we're still way above what. Uh, sales were in 2019 and 2020 for that matter. So I think there's some some positive stories into in, behind the forecast. There's some growth, still some very strong growth areas within the different subsectors, and I'll get to that later on. I pointed out as well at the table there, maybe just one highlight when it comes to what I was talking about, about the points of purchase for beverages, right? A lot of the sales forecasts are influenced and driven by some of that transition from where we were during the pandemic and going through all the different ways of COVID to where we are now. And if you look at bar sales, it's 12.7% 12, 12 growth in sales of beverages that come, that, that happen at, at, from in bars. Um, but that's still, that's a pretty good number, but it's still way off what it was in 2019. Because if you look at 2020, the decline in sales was absolutely astounding, as astounding as as uh, with forty four point two percent decline, right? And if you look at restaurant sales, so for all of food and beverages, so that's not just beverages, but for all food uh, and beverages, sales of food and beverages, uh, forty percent of that comes at the from restaurants usually prior to the pandemic, and restaurant sales went up twenty three percent in twenty twenty one. So that's a positive, but still. A little bit above 20% less than what it was prior to the pandemic. So there's been a rebound in 2021 when you think of food services, but we're not there yet in terms of you know having to live through a full year of a rebound. And I'm not even sure that 2022 is going to be it, given the sixth wave that we had at the beginning of the year, right? So keep that in mind. I think some of the forecasts are definitely influenced by what we're seeing in terms of and, um, the, the sort of the transition towards a normalization of some, some kind of some sort. Now, one of the things that matters a great deal in this inflationary environment are margins, right? Because it's one thing to say that sales are growing and there's a little bit of growth in volume for sure from a, from a, a, a higher demand from consumers. But what about margins, right? Because profitability matters, obviously. And if you build an index of margins, um, this picture shows that actually 2021 wasn't a bad year, was, was actually we've had a little bit of an increase. We still have margins overall for the entire beverage sector that is low, that are lower than 2019. But as you'll see, as we're breaking, breaking it down by subsector, you'll see that the picture looks a bit different across sectors. There are still some sectors that are struggling with really some very significant pressure on margins. And I'll be able to speak to so what we can expect in 2022 when it comes to margins. And overall, if you look at our forecasts, I'm so sorry, before I get to that, I want to say a few words about the operating environment. Um, what I did, I, I, I pointed out with an arrow, two lines at the very bottom of this table. There are tons of st different statistics that relates to the operating environment. When it comes to the economic environment, consumers' ability or purchasing power matters a great deal to explain the strength a de of demand that beverage manufacturers are going to face. Disposable income has been going up, so that's a positive. Savings, uh, well, actually on the table here, if you look at 2021 versus 2020, savings did decline, but you know we had a somewhat of a, I was gonna say pleasant surprise for the first quarter of 2022 when we saw savings of households actually go up 
because of that sixth wave, the inability to spend. So the bottom line is we have consumers in Canada still carrying a lot of savings. Their debt to income situation is not great, but it's slightly better now at the beginning of 2022 than it was at the end of 2021. And actually, it's quite important given all the inflation that we see in the marketplace, higher interest rates and so forth. So I'll speak to that in a moment. But before I get to that, I want to talk about the circle that I highlighted, because if we um, think of pressures on margins for beverage manufacturers, one of the drivers that I think applies to across all subsectors of the beverage industry are the pressures on the labor market, right? So the number that I um, highlighted there is the job vacancy rate. And if you look at this number and compare it right to the number right above it, well, you see that the job vacancy rate doesn't appear very much higher for the beverage and tobacco industry than it is for the all of the industries in Canada. But having said that, 50 basis points actually makes a bit of a difference. And you see that if we compare the vacancy rate in 2021 at 5.2%, compare that to 3% in 2020, that's a big jump. And we're just starting to see pressures in on wages arising because of this high job vacancy rate and the tight uh, pool of available workers, right? A lot of people are pointing out that you know wages have not gone up at the same pace as inflation. We had the most recent statistic for inflation was released yesterday. 7.7% is the inflation rate in the overall economy. If you look at food, we're in that 8.8%. An interesting fact about beverages and inflation at the retail level for beverages, inflation, no matter what the sector is, inflation is always lower than 4%. So it's, it looks to be more difficult for beverage manufacturers to be passing on a high, a, the higher cost that they face than, for example, food processors. And so we'll get to that later on, the reasons why and so forth, right? Um, so if I go back to this, pressures on wages, they're just starting to appear. Yes, the wage rate is not moving up faster that, or at a faster pace than inflation. But if you just focus on the new hires, and the wages paid to those new hires and compare that those to the existing workers and workers that have been in their jobs for some time, that rate of growth in wages is actually pretty much in line with inflation. So it makes me think that we have not seen the end of the inflationary pressures when it comes to wages. And that's something that's, that's definitely a watch out for businesses. I mean, labor is a major, major strategic asset for all manufacturers. Now it's, it used to be five or 10 years ago, it was all about technology and now it, it is all about labor. Um, so the one thing that is on the mind of a lot of people, you know, sort of talking to customers in the last couple of months is inflation. So I was saying it, inflation is really high and it is likely to actually um, limit consumer spending and hurt the ability of, or the spending power of consumers. Now, the beverage industry has actually historically done well in, in an environment where it's a little bit more challenging and difficult. When wallets are tight, the beverage industry actually is quite resilient. But having said that, given the inflationary pressures that we have that are quite different than what we've used to see in a period prior to a projected slow economic slowdown, because we think that at some points with higher interest rates, this is going to slow spending power. This is going to slow consumer spending. Already, we're starting to see the real estate slow down a little bit, the real estate market slow down. So all of that is going to slow down the economy towards the end of 2022 and early 2023. Now, I'm not suggesting that we're going to get to a recession. Um, we, it is possible that we manage to avoid a recession, but there is, in my mind, definitely an economic slowdown on the horizon for uh, the next six to 12 months. And that is going to have an impact, even if we are in a sector that's quite resilient when it comes to economic conditions and, and then a future economic slowdown, I think consumers are going to be sensitive to some of the, um, some of the, um, the, the, the economic slowdown and pinch that they're going to feel because of inflation. Now, if I can just talk about interest rates for a minute and then I'll jump in into the subsectors. Uh, we got interest rates that have already started to go up. So the Bank of Canada had one recently, one increase 
a 50 basis point in its policy rate. That's the second consecutive increase of 50 basis points. Prior to that, there was another 25 basis point increase. So overall, for the, the first few months of, of 2022, we've had the Bank of Canada raise its policy rate by 125 basis points, 1.25%. But in my mind, what matters most is what is expected from the Bank of Canada going forward, right? And so to talk about these expectations, what I'm putting up on the screen is interest rates for different um, bonds, right? So you're looking at bond interest rates for a one-year bond, five-year bond, 10-year bond. And these interest rates in the financial markets are driving a lot of the loan rates that are going to be offered to businesses looking to borrow money. And the financial markets, what they've done so far is basically are fully expecting the Bank of Canada to lift its key policy rate by around 175 basis points more. There's one increase of 50 basis points on the horizon for July, another one in August, and another one in October. And then perhaps even another 25 basis points before the end, before the year is done. So that means 175 basis, basis points, 1.75%. And then, you know, so that's fully captured in the marketplace. So a business looking to, for example, borrow money on a fixed five-year rate, uh, is looking to pay right now you know, close to 2.5% more from a for a five-year rate than it, um, or 2 to 2.5% 2 more for a five-year rate than loan that uh, it used to, to be able to secure about a year ago. Now, this is fully baked in, and the question is going forward, do we expect more interest rate increases? And what the financial markets are telling us is that no. Uh, we're not. We're not anticipating higher interest rates because we do think that by the end of this year, early 2023, you know, the economy is going to be slowing down and that's going to tackle inflation. But of course, markets can be wrong. But, um, you know, so far, you know, that's what they're suggesting, that rates are probably where they are going to be for the foreseeable future until we learn a little bit more about how tackling inflation is going to impact the overall economy. So um, if I'm advancing the slide, you know, this is just sales projected at the overall beverage industry level. So I think it's, it illustrates really well sort of the takeaways. I mean, all the sectors will have different numbers and so forth, but the storyline is quite similar, at least for three of the four sectors that I'm going to be talking about. So there's really strong growth in 2021. And if you look at 2022, and that's on the back of limited inflation. Again, I want to point this out that in the beverage sector, we've had limited inflation at retail at the manufacturing level. So that creates a challenge for margins. But in terms of sales overall, there's still some strong volume growth, you know, in sales behind the numbers that I'm showing. And so in 2022, though, we have a little bit of a decline. Now, this looks to be not so positive unless you focus on the difference between 2022 and what it was in 2019 and 2020. So 2021 was a, a, a really strong year. Um, there's been a lot of, still a lot of constraints on the ability of consumers to uh, consume beverages in different retail places and food services and so forth. The fact is that when consumers stay more at home, they tend to drink a little bit more, certainly from the alcoholic side of things uh, or alcoholic beverages side of things. So. I, I think that's going to have a little bit of a damp, that's going to dampen it, or that is dampening a little bit of the outlook that we have in the marketplace. But the bottom line is that despite the little bit of a decline um, that we have or return to more of an average type of growth, I think it's still very positive to say that, you know, overall we have numbers that are significantly higher than what they were in 2019 and 2020. Now, there, within each of the subsector, there's some areas of growth as well that we want to emphasize throughout. So let me now just focus on the specific subsectors. I'm going to start with breweries. Uh, if you look at the forecast for breweries, as I said, I mean, the forecast for the different subsectors look a lot like the forecast of the overall aggregate beverage industry. We had a really, really strong year in, in 2021. And despite a pretty strong start of the year when it comes to sales for breweries, fact is that it's going to be really difficult to repeat the performance of the summer of 2021 in the summer of 2022 because the summer of 2021 was really really strong so the, all the evidence right now point to limited growth in sales now there are some segments of the industry that are growing if you look at um, heart seltzer 
if you look at beer with a high um, content of alcohol or low caloric type of beers, they, you know, there are some segments of growth for sure in the industry, uh, but overall in the aggregate, you know, this, what the, this is what the picture looks like when it comes to um, sales for breweries. Now, when it comes to margins, I think this is really where uh, we need to spend a little bit of time because margins are been, have been declining and are at the lowest point, you know, if you build an index of where revenues are versus what the operating expenses are, this is an index of gross margins for breweries. And this, this, this has been quite a bit of struggle in 2021. Now, not necessarily surprising. I mean, barley prices are, have nearly doubled in, in, you know, right now compared to what they were two years ago. If you look at uh, aluminum prices, uh, aluminum product prices, they went up 38. I'm looking at my numbers just to make sure I got the right numbers, but looking went up 38% in 2021. Uh, another 30 or so uh, percent um, uh, in, in the early part of the year in 2022 so far. So that's a pretty strong growth. If you look at paperboard prices, 11% increase in 2021 and another 15% increase year over year for the first part of 2022. So just a few examples, I was talking about labor issues, just a few examples that speak to sort of the higher costs that breweries face. Now, one of the challenges in the industry is really to pass on the higher costs up all the way up to retail and consumers. And for, I mean, reality is that it's been really difficult to pass on some of the higher costs. There might be a number of reasons behind this, uh, you know, certainly if you look at the competition in the sector, it's quite intense. We've had breweries and in numbers increase between 2015 and 2021. The number of breweries increased by 150%. So there's definitely more competition, more products available. And I think it, it, it just speaks to this little bit of the bargaining relationship at the retail level with manufacturers as well so this has been really challenging i think opening up you know and sort of finding back a little bit of the normality when it comes to points of purchase if you think of tap rooms if you think of the ability to sell direct to consumers and so forth i think that's going to help because those usually channels are at a higher margin um and, 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 and reality as well is that consumers still have very strong, you know, still want to put a lot of emphasis on local, getting to know the, the manufacturers and sort of that relationship with direct to consumers, right? So th there's just lots of areas, small or some segments of the industry that are growing, but it's going to be a little bit more challenging finding those higher margins products in here in this environment, simply because consumers at some point in time later in the year, maybe early 2023, I feel are going to be a little bit more price sensitive uh, than, they've, than they've been over the course of the last um, couple of years. Now, moving on to uh, wineries, from a sales standpoint, the picture looks quite similar to what I presented you, right? So strong growth in 2021, a little bit of a projected decline, in, in 2022. Part of the story, if you think of wineries that is different than breweries, for example, breweries 90 plus percent of, of, of consumptions produced in Canada. So but what, so that's a bit different than for wineries that face a lot of international competition. If and and part of the the environment there and the competition that wineries face is function of the value of the Canadian dollar. So, for example, in 2021, we had the Canadian dollar gain value against the euro. So that made, made all the European wines more competitive in the Canadian market simply because it was cheaper to import at given the exchange rate between the Canadian dollar and the euro. On the flip side of that, I mean, the opposite was true with regards to U.S. wines, right? So the Canadian dollar lost value against the U.S. dollar, and um, that made it a little bit more expensive, you know, for consumers to purchase U.S. wine. So that's a factor that explains some of the competition in the marketplace. Uh, I think this, the, I was going to say good news, not, I mean, good news and bad news in the sense that, you know, we expect the currency movements to be quite similar for the rest of 2022. A lot of discussions right now in Europe about increasing interest rates and some of the discussion actually resembled to the discussion around the sovereign debt crisis that we've had so many years ago and some of the struggles that some of the country, some of countries that are carrying a lot of debt, public debt, are going to be faced with higher interest rates. So 
I mean, all those those issues and discussion around sovereign debt and price, a potential sovereign debt crisis in Europe and so forth, I, I think that's going to keep the euro low. And that's probably going to keep our Canadian dollar strong, Canadian dollar strong relative to the euro. On the flip side of that, you know, maybe a global economic slowdown towards the end of the year, early 2023, we'll probably see the U.S. dollar go up in value against the Canadian dollar. We think the Canadian dollar could go as low as 74, 75 cents. And so that will shape some of the competitive pressures in the wine industry. One of the things in the wine industry that is worth keeping an eye on are inventories. And so if you look at uh, the growth in the inventories over the last few years, it's been slightly outpacing the growth in sales. It makes sense that inventories would go up at this, around the same pace as sales. You want to um, offset maybe the risk of perhaps a poor harvest in any given year with poor production, limited production that would have an impact on the volumes you're able to produce in any given year. 2021 was a challenging year, I would say. You know, in, in, in BC, for example, we had a dry summer and then during harvest, we had rains, flooding. So that made it challenging at harvest and somewhat similar story, not to the same extent, but somewhat similar in the sense of difficult or challenging harvest as well in Ontario. So all of that combined made it a bit challenging in 2021. The growth's there, competition's always an issue. And I think we need to be watching out for, for, for inventories. If inventories continue to grow, uh, that could signal that at some point in time, because it's costly to carry inventory. So at one point in time, we'd have to maybe businesses look to actually bring down inventories. And if to do so, it requires, for example, to be flexible in pricing. Well, that's something that, you know, in the winery sector, it's, it's, it's always an issue, right? In the sense that uh, pricing is such a critical marketing tool and an important part of the brand that uh, we have to be careful when it comes to marketing with prices and, and, and dealing with inventories to lower prices. So one of the things to monitor for the industry going forward. When it comes to distilleries, again, the, the outlook for um, sales is going to be somewhat similar in the sense that 2022 will show a little bit of a decline. The difference being that, you know, we've had a decline now for some years. And part of the story is, again, this, this very strong competition that we face from, from foreign suppliers. Now, there's some growth areas for sure. If you look at some of the spirits like um, rum, vodka, gin, those are categories that have seen some growth domestically, and that's a good thing. I, we have more and more small to medium-sized businesses that are offering a product that appeals to consumers that are looking for a local, um, a local product or a local alternative. So I think that's a good thing, an area for growth as well. But this is definitely an area where the um, competition matters. The appreciation of the Canadian dollar did matter quite a bit in terms of the ability to supply the Canadian market at a lower price point than, um, than what we've seen recently. But nonetheless, there's some areas for growth that I think are important to monitor. And from a margin standpoint, um, not a surprise really, but again, some very significant challenges at, at, on margins for, for distilleries. Um, it is really difficult, anything from material, raw material to labor, um, costs have been moving up with limited ability to um, to actually uh, pass on some of the higher costs. And I was talking about the number of breweries recently that has been increasing in Canada. If you look at distilleries in 2015, I believe we had nine, around 95, it was lower than 100, around 95 establishments that were uh, recorded in Canada. And at the end of 2021, we had over 300 uh establishments so businesses and manufacturers that were in that sector so that's quite a growth that uh, in the sector and again that speaks to or that makes the uh, makes it harder to pass on the cost or the higher cost all the way up to consumers and that's definitely a challenge in the industry that's going to have to get resolved because there's some, some significant challenges when it comes to profitability here and finally, the non-alcoholic beverage sector category. It's it's a, it's a very broad category itself as well. It's everything from carbonated flavored water to pre-made coffee drinks to iced tea to soft drinks. To, so there are a lot of different types of beverages. 
But this is overall as a category and a category that's been, that's showing some growth and not all of the category for sure, but or not all of the products within the category for sure, but there has been some growth in the industry uh, and in project that in 2022, we're still going to record some growth. Now margins also are a little bit of a different story, right? So we're shifting away from the environment where there's a lot of pressure on margins to an environment where margins are actually trending up after some difficult times in 2018, 19. And part of the reason I do think is, again, the environment. We're in an environment where demand's a bit stronger or growth or showing some growth, a stronger growth. And that, I think, itself makes it a little bit easier to pass on some of the higher costs. Because from a cost standpoint, I mean, some of the costs are pretty much the same across all the other different subsectors and so really i do think it's a it's a matter of competition that uh, and the strength of demand that uh, these businesses actually face in the marketplace so that's the overview of the sector uh like i said you can go to our website at fcc.ca and find a copy of the report you'll do you'll find some more statistics um and uh, a lot more insights as to what is going on for all the Four different sectors that I mentioned. So I'll turn it over to you, Darlene. So let's see if you have any questions in the Q&A box that uh, we could look at. Well, thanks. Thanks, JP, for that uh, great overview of the of the report. Uh, you brought lots of uh, good extra information for each of the sectors. And I do invite the audience uh, present here today, if they do have any questions, to please drop that in the chat um, on your right hand side and we'll be able to ask JP. In the meantime, while you're thinking about your questions, I do have a question here uh, for you, JP. And it's uh, going back to your talk at the beginning about interest rates and the raising uh, potential, you know, raising interest rates coming forward in the next few months. What do you suggest that businesses that are looking to invest either in equipment or just grow their businesses in the next little bit, should they be looking at locking in interest rates in the shorter term or longer term more so? Well, super good question, right? And frankly, a question that we hear all the time from our customers. Right? And, and the answer, unfortunately, is not as simple as, as the question. So the answer is, all right, on one hand, the financial markets are telling us we're done. You know, we're done anticipating higher rates. We don't think once we have these, these, these three more, three to four more rate increases from the Bank of Canada, that's going to be enough to slow down, bring down inflation closer to the Bank of Canada target. And we still believe that the bank can do it. The Bank of Canada can do it. Right? So there's confidence in the marketplace. It is confidence from the marketplace and the Bank of Canada. So that's one thing. So if you do believe that, and you know, depending on the extent of how higher rates slow down the economy, then you could actually, it's not impossible that sometime in 2023, we do have rates that's, that are started to actually trend the opposite direction, go lower. So that might be an incentive here to wait a little bit before locking in some interest rates, right? And then there's a flip side of the argument. The flip side is, well, you know what? We've been saying that inflation is going to be coming down for a while now. And I'll take full accountability. I mean, I'm one of those economists that thought that inflation was going to be temporary, right? And just something that we can get a hold of and slow down really fast. And it hasn't been the case. And we're still trending up. So forget even about saying a, a tipping point, so to speak, and, and a reversal in the trend. We still have inflation that's trending up. So there's a case to be made that, you know what? The bank is going to take some more time and that's going to require some more increases in interest rates before we get to the point where we're going to tackle inflation. I do believe that the bank is very determined to get inflation under control and that might actually trigger the recession. So uh, bottom line is we might have future rate increases, but the likelihood is that we probably have seen, more than likely have seen everything that we're likely to see for the next little while here until we get a little bit more insights as to how much of a slowdown that we're going to have in the economy. So there might be a reason, an argument to wait a little bit. I think that the, the exercise to do is just sit down with your financial partners and do some stress testing, right? So do some, some, some assumptions and say, all right, if my margins are this and that, you know, and I see it and I have these loans to renew or, or I'm considering buying this and that, like, what does it do to my financial risk if I'm not locking in interest rates? And if I see interest rates go up by 100, another 100 basis point, another 150 basis point, right? To understand this exposure to risk. Historically, it's always been a good strategy to sort of have this 
this diversified loan portfolio in which you're going to have some loan loans under variable rate and you're going to have some short-term loans and then some long-term loans as well. So that's that's the best piece of advice that I could give. Just understand the financial risk exposure because, I mean, there's lots of potential variability when it comes to interest rates going forward in the next 12 to 18 months. Great, great. Thanks, uh, JP. And we have a question here it's from the audience and it's, it's more uh, in relation to packaging. So um, the, the the person is wondering if you uh, or your team monitors the changing preference for beverage packaging, like whether it be plastic, aluminum, whatever. And are there any noticeable trends that you're seeing in relation to, you know, packaging within the beverage sector? Well, I don't, I wouldn't say that we are monitoring this really closely, but it's hard to ignore the ESG emphasis in the sector and the food sector, food and beverage sector, right? And I do think this is not going to go away. Um, and, and businesses are going to have, whether required to do so, or whether finding it in their own best interest to actually do it voluntarily and then move packaging towards more of a sustainable future. And, and I think this is a definite trend that we're going to have to face. And I do think that, unfortunately, it, this is not likely to actually alleviate some of the costs. Now, if you look at some of the traditional packaging, I mean, the costs are pretty high. did mention it in my presentation. But I would, I would argue that businesses are going to have to make a step in that direction. There's some, a little bit more technology uh, in the marketplace now than it had been the case for, for a while. So I do think that's a good first step. But I really do think it's, it's definitely a fundamental trend when you think of the overall emphasis on, on, on ESG here. Mm. And whether it be even the consumer pushing for that, right? Those more environmental sustainable packaging yeah. and, and just regulation around, you know, um, plastics, lowering plastics. We're seeing it in grocery stores and retail and around plastic bags and stuff like that. Absolutely. Um, so if we go back, I have another question around um, inflation. You were talking, if we move back into the economic side of things, the inflationary pressures that are really um, being driven by the war in Ukraine, or part of them are being driven um, through the war in Ukraine. And should we expect that commodity prices, um, you know, that, that are going to remain elevated, like over the next few months as this conflict lasts? I would say so. I mean, if you think of, you know, if you think of breweries, for example, and the higher cost of barley and so forth, you know, all the grains that they can be using in, in their production. Um, I mean, the, like, the one thing I like to point out is that prior to the, the war in Ukraine, prices were elevated in the first place and they were trending up already. It's just that the war in Ukraine amplified everything. So if it had not been for Russian invasion, we would still be dealing with prices that are really high. Now, I think the situation, a lot is going to be resolved. Resolve, a lot of the uncertainty is going to be resolved. I'm not going to say that the situation is going to be resolved and the prices will decline, but I think a necessary condition for prices to go back towards a long-term average is for to have some really good crops in North America. So that's one thing to monitor. Uh, right now, it looks positive. The outlook looks positive, you know, maybe a little bit better than average, but I mean, there's still a long ways to go in, in July and August. And so we'll have to wait and see. We're now doing shooting this at the end of June and things look okay, but this is a necessary condition. So we're not done yet. The other thing to monitor is that may bring a little bit of relief from a commodity standpoint, not just in the in the primary, so for, for grains, for example, but other commodities as well, is, is what's going on with the world economy, right? The higher probability of a global recession right now, I mean, we're seeing these probabilities almost every day trending up and now up to close to 50%, according to some um, financial institutions. And so overall, I think do think that this could slow down the demand for commodities and bring a little bit of relief that we don't see prices decline. But we're going to have to have good harvest in North America before we see any type of relief. I think that's a necessary condition. And unfortunately, we might have to wait until 23, you know, way into 2023 before we see a, a bit more significant relief when it comes to uh, raw material prices. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So if we look at the businesses and maybe some people here on the call would be interested just in the fact that, you know, we're in a, we're in this environment where maybe our margins are a little tighter because of all what you've spoken about since the beginning. 
And, and some of the business here might be having some negative cash flow in their own business. And what, what could you suggest like to how do businesses pull through and survive during this environmental, uh, this operational, you know, the system, how it is right now? Yeah. So very good question. And, and um, it's not unusual to see, you know, some sort of imbalance or lag between revenues and costs and then have negative cash flows. Right. But I mean, there are plenty of different possible different reasons why you would have, you would find yourself in a situation with negative cash flows. I think the first, first and foremost, you have to apply the proper diagnostic, right? So you have to be realistic about what is the source of this negative cash flow so you know is this overhead costs or is this you know investments that have been made too fast or uh is there a possibility is this is the issue on the revenue side of things you know is there anything wrong with pricing uh can i just invest in developing my sales a bit more i mean there are just tons of multiple reasons why you would you know a business would find in this situation but it's just a, applying the proper diagnosing the issues and then just working with your partners to find the solutions, I think is critical as well, because this is not something that you would want left and attended for a while here. So um, like I said, not necessarily unusual to see in the sector, this imbalance between revenues and costs, but I, we do think we do do have to have a, a solution to, just to fix the issue over the medium term. That's a great, great pieces of advice uh, there, JP. Thanks for that. And uh, I see that we uh, no longer have any questions from our audience, so that I think will cover, um, you know, our event for today. And uh, thank you, JP, for being with us and the time that you've provided us and all those great insights here. And uh, thank you to our guests that have joined the event today. You you'll be receiving in a few days um, an email uh, with a link to the recording of today's presentation, so you'll be able to rewatch it or share it with others. And in that same email, you'll also receive the actual food, um, the actual, excuse me, beverage report that JP spoke to today. And there'll also be an evaluation form in there. Um, and we'd appreciate that you take, you know, a few minutes of your time to complete that evaluation. And that'll help us develop and improve uh, our FCC events uh, moving forward. And one last thing is please stay tuned because in September, FCC will be publishing once again its mid-year food and beverage report update. And JP will be joining us for another event to talk about that report. So if you're interested in participating, you can complete um, the form. That will be in the email that you'll be receiving. And this will ensure that you'll be updated uh, with the details as they become available for that event in September. So. Um, that's it, folks. On behalf of all of us here at FCC, thank you once again for joining us today. And uh, please all take care of yourselves. Have a great day.